Gentlemen, welcome back to Project Squareal. I was starting to think maybe I should call it Will this project ever be finished before Project Binky? Um, but I heard some news this week that some of the parts that I've been waiting for from the UK will not arrive till early next year at the earliest, so I get a feeling Binky might be beating me to the road. Never mind. A good thing did happen this week and lesson for the week learned that no matter how many times you run out and look at the letterbox the posty only arrives once a day maybe if you're lucky and the freight will arrive when it arrives and this week i received my missing bearing shells from the uk that is good news indeed that means i can start assembling this engine finally after all this time so i want to do two things this morning or today I want to test fit the conrods, so the bearing shells and the conrods, and measure the, the gap between the bearing shell and the bearing journal. Now the engine reconditioner has measured and told me what bearings to get, which I've got. Um, this is just to double check. I believe the math and I trust in the math, but I don't always believe in packaging. So I need to make sure what is stamped on the bearing and what is stamped on the packet is actually correct. And to do this we use an old friend of the engine builder, Plasti Gauge. Which you probably won't be able to see, but Plasti Gauge is a little thin strip of plastic, uh, which you put on the crank journal. You tighten up the bearing cap to the appropriate torque, you release it, and then you measure how much the Plasti Gauge is squished, and that will tell you um, how much clearance you got between the shell and the journal. The aerial handbook does not give me a figure of how much gap there should be. Um, however, remembering back many, many moons ago to apprentice days, I think we worked on a rule of thumb of about a thou per um, inch of bearing journal. And these are, I think, 1.75 inch. Um, so I'm looking for around about a thou and a half. Really, I won't be able to do much um, if it's a little bit out, but if it's a long way out, I'll know there's something wrong with the with the bearing. I've measured the all the journals, and they're all um, I've measured them with the vernier. It's not not as accurate as a micrometer, um, but they're all within hui of each other, so I know I'm pretty close here. Um, I just need to make sure that the shells are correct. So to do that, we have to fit the shell into the appropriate conrod which is locating the little tab in there, make sure it's near enough to flush and just push that in like so. Um, the little tab is to stop the bearing shell rotating uh, should something not very nice happen or just under heavy load or, or whatever. Um, if you have a catastrophic failure, whether you have a tab there or not is probably the least of your problems. I previously received the shells for, um, or half of the shells, which is two pair of them. So I just have two pair to check now. Um, and these are going to be on journals number three and four, which is on the drive side of the cranks, front crank and rear crank. There was always a lot of conjecture whether you should oil the cap or not when you're doing this. Uh, my opinion is that the bearing is running in oil when the engine is running, so that is how you should test it. A little film of oil is probably only going to add a micron or two to the, to the gap anyway, but um, it does help the plastic gauge to stick. You do this on top. Normally I'll do it on the lower shell, um, but for the purposes of video and you being able to see it, I might just do it on the top. Never done it like that before, so it'll be interesting to see what it does, if anything.
Once I've nipped these up, I'll get the torque wrench onto them because we need to tighten them to its operating torque, which is 23 foot pounds for this. And here's a torque wrench that I've set earlier. Hard not to move the crank, uh, the corner rod, but it's proven to be almost impossible. Okay, so that should have squished up the plastic gauge now. Um, I have new nuts and washers for the for the Conrad bolts. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to um, find replacement bolts for it, which would have been nice if I could have replaced the bolts, but unfortunately, it's not going to happen. Right, you won't be able to tell on the camera, so I'll put in a still photo. Um, but I've put my plastic gauge packet, comes with a little measuring chart. I've put that on and I'm just over one and a half there, so I am happy with that. Clean that off. And I'll re repeat that with, that was number four, I need to do number three. The other job that I've done off camera is I've replaced the oil gallery plugs in both cranks. We need them. So the whole, this whole restoration journey began because square four aerial engines have a bit of a reputation. If they haven't been looked after in a former life or they've been sat for a long time, which this one had, it's possible that the oil galleries through the cranks can coke up with gunge and schmutz. What happens then? It'll starve the, the bearing journals of oil. So for light running around town, things like that, probably not a problem. Um, it'll get enough residual oil going through to, to be okay. What will happen is you're, uh, you're out with your mates on that sunny Sunday that you've been waiting all winter for. You're going for a blast. Nice big open straight road, wide open the throttle, journal starve of oil, engine seizes, you're picking up bits of alloy casing and bottom end and, and crankshafts on the ground and crying for a long long time because you will never ever get new cases for these. Um, it's happened too many times, they're just not around. Mark 1 cases uh, can be found if you're lucky, um, Mark 2's much rarer. So, so again this whole strip down began because I wanted to make sure that those galleries were clean they had a bit of gunge in them but they weren't too bad but better to do it anyway uh, they say you should do it pull down the engine and clean out those galleries every 20,000 miles which is what 35,000 K or something um, I'll probably never ever reach that mileage so that might be a job for Someone well up after I'm gone. Hopefully the bike is still going for a long, long time to come yet. So I've done those. We're going to put the um, crankshafts on. Um, again, in a perfect world, I'd be doing the um, gudgeon journals at the same time, making sure that they're a good fit. I'm going to have to take a risk on those, that they're measured up okay, because uh, the barrels are off at the engine reconditioner now getting measured up. So I'm not 100% which pistons I need to get, so I need to hear back from him. There will be another month waiting for pistons to come from the UK. Uh, so it's probably going to be nearly Christmas time by the time I get the, the barrels ready to go on. Um, I really want to get some progress happening and at least get the bottom end together. So I'm going to take a punt. 
if I have to pull it down again, I have to. At least I know how to do it, which is a good thing. Right, so let's measure up the other, let's measure up the other journals, uh, check the bearing clearances. We'll put the cranks in and we'll do the crankshaft end float. Okay, where we last left off, um, it's a bit of a step backwards and about five steps forward. So we need to, so a bit of stuff happened off camera and we'll just touch base on that quickly. I was checking the bearing clearances on the bearing journals and the crankshafts. Uh, three of them went together really, really well. One of them I had a heck of a job with. It just, when I did it up, didn't feel right. Um, it measured up okay, but it just had that gut feeling. It wasn't right. So any kind of fault diagnosis, you just need to take your time, step through the troubleshooting steps one at a time, and don't change two things. Always change one thing, check what you've done, redo it, move on to the next one, check it, etc. Otherwise, if, if you do a scattergun approach and change a whole lot of things, you might fix it, but you won't know what you did. Um, that won't do you any good. So, I swapped the bearings over, the shells over from uh, one journal to the other. Um, again, the problem, problem stayed with the journal, so I knew it was something on that side. It had to be either the conrod or the journal itself. Uh, so I took a known good conrod from another journal and put it on the on the crank side that I was having a problem with. That worked perfectly. Okay, so that narrowed it down to the um, conrod itself. I knew they'd measured up okay. Um, I tried swapping out um, one half of a bearing shell. Again, no problem doing that. They haven't been used before, so there's going to be no, no worry doing that. That made no difference. So I put that back. I swapped out the other half of the bearing shell. That made no difference. Um, the last thing I tried, and I guess it is the last thing I tried because it worked, was I turned around the, the cap. I tightened that up, fit it like a dream. It worked like it was always meant to be there, so um, I have no idea why, why that was an issue, um, but it's worked. Everything talked up well, um, as well as being talked. The nuts are held in with a, um, with a little cotter pin, so the pins have been put in. And they turn beautifully. Currently, though, um, still another job to do. I need to set the end float on the cranks. Now, the end float is set by pulling the crank away from the bearings. There's a thrust washer on the timing side, so we tighten up a, a nut on this side, it pulls the crank over. Um, the logical thing is to think you do the shimming from the main bearing side, the ball bearing side, but that is not the case. You need to do the shimming on the on the offside. I've done a dry run of that, so I've got a reasonably good idea of, of what it's like. Um, but I want to I want to time the two cranks before I do it finally. I won't be able to. I've also put the camshaft in. That was pretty straightforward, wasn't worth filming that. There was a, a bearing on, again there was a shin for, for end float. I've measured the end float, it's fine. Uh, I've put the timing gear on and the drive gear for the oil pump. I won't be able to stitch up uh, this side of the, the um, crank box yet because I need to time the, the cranks to the camshaft. I mean, I won't be able to do that until I put the barrels on because I need to put the generator in. And I need to put the barrels on before I put the generator in because I won't be able to do it afterwards, it won't fit. The rear crank timing gear, it has three Allen, uh, Woodruff key cutaways in it. They look all the same, um, but in fact they're not 120 degrees apart. So that is what gives you your timing of your crankshafts to the, to the camshaft. The area will run one tooth out, but it's not ideal, we want to have it right. Uh, to do that, I'll need to set up my dial gauge. Again, I need the barrels on that, put the cam followers in so I can put something with the dial gauge on so I can measure cam lift and a degree wheel. So, I can check the end float now, um, but it won't be the final fit for that, so it won't be able to stitch up this side. What I can do,
since I can go to the other side and we can fit the coupler gears which is what makes a square four a square four tying the two crankshafts together. One of the back orders that arrived uh, in the last couple of weeks have been the, the dampening call it a bush, it's not really a bush, it's a dampening pad in here. It just takes a metallic noise out of the out of the two timing gears as they roll around. I wasn't going to replace them because a bit more noise in an old British motorbike is not going to make any difference. Uh, but they turned up off back water. I was a little bit dreading doing the riveting on these but as it turned out it was pretty straightforward. I knocked the top off the old rivets, punched them through Put the, the dampeners on, smacked them with the drill from the back, bang, 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 four holes, put them over, and it was pretty simple to, to put the new rivets in. So, these guys have timing marks on them, they have a dot, and they have a two dot. Uh, you need to set them, set the cranks up, so that, so that the dots mesh. Um, it's one little dot in between two big dots. Does not matter which way it is. Is that way? Nope. One. Um, as long as you get that pattern. Otherwise the cranks will be there. They'll be out of kilter. So to do that, um, so instead of taking them off, you need a special puller. This is one that I've had for many, many years that a, a dear friend of mine made for me. So what we'll do Screw the puller up, screw the puller on, line up the crank to the, to the keyway, slide him on, you can feel that engage, it's about there, and I'll tap it on with a hammer. Um, I'm just going to warm up the gear first to expand it a bit, to make it a bit easier to tap on. Right, bear with me while I warm this up. Put some heat into the gear with the, with the hot gun, which is smoking a rag about to burst into flame. So we'll just put some heat into into the gear now. It's just a straight shaft interference fit. There's nothing too flashy about that. I can feel that locating. In fact, I can almost push it on by hand. That gear went on really nicely. In fact, this whole engine is going together very nicely. Um, having good gear and everything so clean just makes the job so much nicer. I have a lot of confidence in, in how this is going to turn out. That is still hot. Gentlemen, it's about two weeks and two minutes ago I professed that the build is going really well and is really, really happy with it. Um, thus putting the engineer's curse on, on what I was doing. At the time, I was putting the, the crankshafts in and putting the timing gears on. So, of course I came across a couple of issues and the issue that I had when I was putting the timing gears on and we'll swing this um, crankcase around in a minute and, and show you what it looks like is that the nuts that hold the gears on Hopefully you can see that in, in frame. Um, were pretty much rooted. So when I went to put them, screw them back on, they were really, really tight on the thread. It just didn't feel good, and they were way too important not to have good nuts holding the engine together. So I thought that'd be easy enough. We'll clean those up. Uh, what I've since found is there's a whole new thread form that I was blissfully unaware of all this time in life. That was um. UNEF, Unified National Extra Fine, and turns out that is used on some Chevrolet stub axles and some truck alternator um, brackets on the end. And it's a 3 quarter by 20 TPI in this. So, a couple of hours on the internet, um, I found one nut in America for a horrific price. Um, couldn't find any anywhere else. I did find a die nut um, in a truck repair um, parts place in Melbourne 
So I was able to get a die nut, so I was able to clean up the threads um, on, the end of the, on the end of the cranks. But that didn't help the nut situation. I still wasn't happy putting um, these old cruddy ones back on. So a bit of head scratching, and I ended up putting another uh, call out to my now BFF Linton, who did the welding for me. Um, of course, he has a really good lathe. Um, I thought cutting a thread wouldn't be a big problem for him. As it turned out, it wasn't. As it turned out, even better. Um, after a bit of hunting around, he had, for reasons absolutely unknown to him or anybody else, he had a um, 3 quarters by 20 TPI tap. So he was able to make, whip me up a new set of crank nuts. So, two weeks later, here we are back again. And the job that I was setting out to doing, which should have been a 10 minute job, um, was checking the crankshaft end float. So there's two end float settings. There's one for the front crank, which I'll need to grab my handy bit of paper, is 3 to 4th hour, which is 0.762 mil to 0.102 millimeter. And the rear crank has a little bit more. It has 5 to 6th hour end float. Uh, so it's 0.127 mil to 0.1524 mil. Um, the other thing that I was going to do while I was waiting for Linton to make these nuts, um, I brought a MIG welder online and I thought I'd build myself a little engine stand. That was easy enough. Online shopping turns out not to be what it, um, it's meant to be. And the welder arrived in a couple of days, great, put it out of the box, and half the bits that were meant to be with it were missing, um, and the thing was damaged itself. So I had to send it back. And that's taken me best part of a week and a half, about two weeks now, trying to get a replacement for that. Um, they did send a, a replacement. Uh, last time I checked on the, on the package um, app to find out where it is, Thank you Australia Post. Uh, it was about a thousand kilometres away in the wrong direction from where I live. So maybe it'll turn up this week, maybe it'll turn up one day, maybe it'll never turn up. Um, yay. So a bit of a Heath Robinson affair for um, holding the engine down. Well I check this, it's a couple of blocks of wood and some woodwork and clamps, um, bottle of oil to hold it steady and it's, it's good enough for me to get a, a reading on the on the cranks, so I'm okay with that. I've measured the front one, uh, it is within spec, so that is good, and we'll show you the back one now. So it's just a dial gauge on the timing gear, and we're just checking for end float. And the rear one is 0.15 mil tolerance is 0.127 to 0.1524 so the rear crank is within the spec as well for end float um, swap them out and I think I might have mentioned this earlier uh, the shimming is all done on the bush side um, so we're pulling the crank away from the bearing uh, I might have a little play and see if I can get it sort of in the middle of tolerance but certainly it's there, that'll do Right, from here, um, I'm going to put the, the damper and sprocket on. On this side, we'll maybe put the oil pump on, um, just to see what it looks like. I have a Morgo high flow oil pump, so really looking forward to seeing how that fits. Um, that'll be a new beating heart for the, for the engine, and um, we'll supply way more oil than the original. Not a lot more I can do. Um, I still need to set the, the um, cam gear, but I can't do that till I get the barrels back, and I can't put the barrels on till I get pistons, and I can't put pistons on till I hear back from the engine reconditioner, which was supposed to be two weeks ago as well, but um, still haven't heard back from him. And then I need to set a dial gauge so I can set the, uh, the camshaft setting. So. As usual, it's hurry up and wait. A lot happening, but everything's holding everything else up. So I'll unclamp this now and just swing around so you can see the timing gears. So that is the, the coupling gears that hold the two cranks together. 
Um, so let's take these rigs out. Let's just protect the, the rods from any bumps and also protect from any dirt or anything getting down the hole, which we do not want at this stage. So that's your um, drive gear. There's a, a coupler on there and another gear for the chain. Um, there's also another bearing that sits on the shaft as well. Um, so as you can see, the cranks turn in opposite directions to each other. Which all in all makes for a, a very smooth engine. And there's a little bit of dust and stuff on there which I need to clean out. Okay, um, so I'll tie up this side. Um, these nuts are just nipped up. I need to, I won't peen them over like the, uh, like someone in the past done. Um, I'll use a, a chemical lock. This is a product called Seal Grip, which is an American product, which is meant to be 10 times more Loctite-y than Loctite. So I'll give that a go. Um, drop that. There are three of these crank nuts, one on this side, one on this side, and one on the rear crank. Um, the coupler gear has a, has a different nut altogether, different size. And it has our oil slinger in here, which we can fit on as well. Right, we'll tie these up and um, we'll come back and see what it looks like. Okay, so I've decided to leave the oil pump for next video. Um, otherwise, this will be a video that goes on and on and on and on, and we'll never get to the end. Um, kind of like this restoration, really. So what I've done, I've put a chemical um, sealant on the crank nuts and tightened those up. The nut on the timing side rear crank, I haven't put a um, lock sealant on yet. Uh, I have done the nut up tight because nuts you either leave visibly loose or you do up tight. You never ever leave them finger tight um, because that's how people forget to do them up and they come off later and that is bad. So I've nipped that up, um, but we will take it off again when I need to set the, the cam timing. So what I'll do, um, I've replaced the bearing shell on the outer bearing for the crank. So there's an inner bearing and an outer. Um, there's an oil slinger seal in there. We've replaced that. I've put a gasket on, put gasket sealant on the inside. Um, you need to only put on one face, which I've done. Although, known for well, it's British, so here's another oil leak on its way. Look at that, practically done. I'll just put the drive gear, it's got a cush drive. Um, so we'll just put him on so you can see what that looks like. It's a spring damper cush drive. There's a special little washer. Uh, it's not in the parts catalogue, um, but it is one of those kind of aerial special things that you find out about. Um, that will stop this nut coming loose, as well as a split from there. Um, again, I'm going to leave that visibly loose for now because I've got it sitting there. And when I do turn it up, I'm just going to go around everything off camera and double check everything for tightness and I'll put a split pin in that. That, my friends, is starting to look like a motorbike again. Or it's nearly square again. With that, I'll sign off for now. Um, yeah, I think next one I'll do the oil pump. Uh, I was going to do it now, but it looks like it might be a bit uh, not quite straightforward to take the old one off, put the old new one on, so I've got to figure that out. Um, and then we're getting closer. Thank you very much, everyone. Don't forget to like and subscribe and all those good things and um, 
I thank you for your positive reinforcement and positive comments. Off now.